Hello friends, welcome back to our Facebook Live walk through the theology of the body. This is Bill Donahue, and it seems a little dark here. Let me see if I can brighten that up. How's that? Hope you're doing well on this Wednesday in uh, August of 2019. We are looking at audience 102 today from John Paul the Great's Catechesis on Human Love. And uh, I'll pray, walk us in. I'm actually going to pick up with something from audience 101 from last week. Uh, in section 11. So let's pray. We got some juicy stuff today, my friends, as always with John Paul II's beautiful teaching. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Lord, thanks again for this time and this technology that connects and unites us. Help us uh, to unpack and understand more deeply this beautiful teaching on human life and love from St. John Paul II. So necessary for our time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, here we go. Uh, we continue our meditation in the second half, well beyond this, the half of the Theology of the Body. Uh, it's been going on for some uh, couple years now. Uh, we are in, au in Audience 101, Section 11, as I begin today, and we'll then transition into uh, Audience 102. John Paul's spiraling deeper into Ephesians chapter 5, which he calls the summa of the entire plan of God for man and woman, right? He says that Ephesians chapter 5 has within it compact, compacted everything God wanted to tell uh, man about himself. So supercharged. And the theme, the watermark behind it all is marriage. So as we, as we step into this again, let's reflect that this concept, this phrase, this word marriage is so bigger than just a man and a woman getting married and starting a family. That, that is a little, the nucleus, basically what John Paul's meditating on, but he sees marriage as massive, as, as literally heaven and earth, uh, sun and moon, um, land and sea. It's cosmic, it's massive. Marriage is the plan of God for all of humanity. So by, as we dwell on this little microcosm of the marriage of man and woman, it doesn't mean you have to be married to get this. It doesn't mean everyone must be sacramentally married in the Catholic Church to understand theology of the body. But understanding what marriage is saying and what it is doing physically, spiritually, and emotionally is our portal, our way into the great mystery of what God wants for all of us. So remember that. Be you single, married, divorced, celibate, consecrated, marriage is the watermark behind the entire universe and God's desire for our hearts. An intimate relationship. So, 101, section 11. In this sense, John Paul reflected last week, marriage as a sacrament, remember sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible reality, so marriage as a visible sign of an invisible reality, also bears within itself the germ or seed of man's eschatological future. That is the perspective of the redemption of the body in the dimension of eschatological hope. Okay, big thoughts here. Pause right there. And that's not even the whole sentence. <laughs> Marriage, as we look upon it as a sacrament, we see man, woman coming together in the most intimate relationship on earth you can understand, physical, spiritual, emotional, right? Coming in together sacramentally married, within that little sign of the man and the woman getting married is a seed or germ of man's eschatological future. Eschaton in the Greek, remember, it means the end, right? So it's what we're looking for. It's our destiny. So here in our history, in marriage, is a seed of our eschatological future. That's pretty amazing. Okay, so heaven is a marriage feast we see in the Gospels and Scripture. It's also, we see this in the dimension of eschatological hope. This is what we long for. So, <clears throat> he goes on in section 11 here, and this is audience 101 from last week. We didn't get to this last week, so I'm diving in now. Uh, pointing to this eschatological future, the words of Jesus, In the resurrection they take neither wife nor husband. Matthew twenty two thirty. Okay, in the historical sense that we're used to understanding it. So the sign falls away to the reality. So he says, those who being sons of the resurrection are equal to the angels and sons of God. 
okay, in the new world. They owe their origin, we owe this in the visible temporal world to the marriage and procreation of man and woman. So this, this intimate bond from which we all come of man and woman on earth in history um, is pointing to that. Marriage thus performs an irreplaceable service with regard to man's extra temporal future, okay, beyond time, above time. Marriage is, performs an irreplaceable service with regard to that future, to the mystery of the redemption of the body and the dimension of eschatological hope. So what's he doing here is he, he's tying, he's connecting history to destiny. And it's marriage that makes that, that bond, literally the bond of marriage. Okay, now, audience 101, I mean 102. This was delivered in December of 1982, and uh, he has subtitled here, uh, Section B, Ephesians, The Spousal and Redemptive Meaning of Love. So he says, uh, jumping down in Section 1, We find ourselves in the sphere of the great analogy, marriage pointing to God, in which marriage as a sacrament is on the one hand presupposed and on the other hand rediscovered. Okay, we start to see something. We rediscover something new. It's presupposed as the sacrament of our human beginning. Okay, we owe our origin, our, our reality, our essence to the marriage of a man and a woman. We exist because the two became one. That's united with the mystery of creation. Your creation, my creation. It's rediscovered by contrast as the fruit of the spousal love of Christ and the church. That's like with the mystery of redemption. Okay, so our earthly origin as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve comes about by the union of male and female, but we rediscover it in the new Adam and the new Eve, Christ and the church. It's pretty awesome. So regardless of what our origin was, what brought us into the world, maybe it wasn't a sacramental marriage. Maybe it wasn't the most beautiful um, Christian coming together of a man and a woman. Uh, maybe our, our family life was a bit of a train wreck, right? And lots of wounds, lots of pain. But point is, there's a rediscovery of the truth of what marriage is meant to be in Christ and his love for the church. Okay, number two, section two of audience 102. Turning directly to the spouses, John Paul says, the author of Ephesians exhorts them to shape their reciprocal relationship on the model of the spousal union of Christ in the church. Okay, so Rebecca and I married 16 years this, this month. Uh, Woohoo! Rebecca and I have to model our, our reciprocal relationship, our giving and rec receiving on Christ in the church. That relationship of Christ in the church is one of unconditional love, mercy, attentiveness, uh, kindness, right, thoughtfulness. Now, sometimes I fail miserably, right? Rebecca never fails. She's perfect. Just kidding. We're both working on it. But in that relationship, Christ and the church is the model for us, right? So, so try, I, I have to try to be as attentive and self-giving as Christ, as loving and as, as present as Christ. And uh, as I give myself to my wife and my children, and Rebecca's call is also, of course, giving, but it's but it's fundamentally through femininity, this receiving of the love, right? And hopefully it enriches her, and it makes Rebecca's own heart a wider space, a garden in which the children can grow, and she can kind of, you know, nest them and bring them about into their own full maturity. And she becomes such a gift for me by receiving me into the nest of her own heart. Uh, so Christ and the church, this beautiful relationship of Christ who gave his life for the church, is a, is a role model for us as married uh, as a married couple. This invitation, I'm a little down further in section two, this invitation, which the Apostle Paul addresses to Christian spouses, has its full motivation, inasmuch as, through marriage as a sacrament, they participate in the salvific love of Christ, which at the same time expresses itself as his spousal love for the church. Okay, we cannot escape the spousal analogy, spousal love. Uh, this is a share, a little further down, in the creative love of God himself. Okay, this love is creative. This love is life-giving. It makes love present. We talked about this before, right? Man and woman come together and make love, uh, physically, bodily, in new life. But anytime man and woman are authentically present and attentive to one another, they're making love present. And I, I've alluded to this before, but uh, this just happened the other day, you know. We, uh, you know, come home from work, you meet in the kitchen, and you hug each other. 
and the kids see this, what are they seeing? They're seeing love made visible. They're seeing love made present. Even if it's a fleeting 15 second hug in the kitchen after work or whatever, or before dinner or while dinner is being cooked, they're seeing in spouses and mom and dad, who are husband and wife, the visibility of the invisible. Okay, they're seeing love made flesh, love incarnate. It's really tr uh, uh, essential that spouses try to make this love visible as much as possible. And that's by doing things for one another, by helping out with one another, by being attentive, by making eye contact with one another. Again, it's challenging these days. It's just a whirlwind of activity in the family sometimes. But the more we can be attentive and grounded in each other, uh, and especially children seeing this, right? This is how humans interact, right? This is how love loves. Okay. Let's jump down to section four of Audience 102 by John Paul the Great. The Pauline image of marriage inscribed in the great mystery of Christ in the church, these two dancing together, brings together the redemptive dimension of love with its spousal dimension. Okay, love is redeeming by its very nature. It saves, right? It saves. It takes in. It redeems. And this is what spousal love is. In some sense, the Pope says, it unites these two dimensions in a single one. Christ has become the church's bridegroom. He married the church as his bride because he gave himself for her. So in every act of self-giving for a husband, uh, you're imaging Christ. You're imaging Jesus. In every act of self-giving. And that's, you know, in, in the beautiful culmination of married love, uh, the sexual embrace, but in clearing out the dishwasher, putting out the recycling, um, fixing the ceiling fan, right, which I tried and failed yesterday night. But everything we're doing in self-giving love, uh, being attentive to the kids when they're in a place of, you know, pain or wounds or, or a struggle or a joy, self-giving love or imaging Christ. Though marriage is a sacrament, um, oops, through marriage as a sacrament, both of these dimensions, okay, the redemption and the, and the spousal meaning of love, these dimensions of love penetrate together with the grace of the sacrament into the life of the spouses. So that's how it becomes life-giving. Now, by the way, let's say this, because, you know, Rebecca and I, with our littles, we have a 10, 9, 6, and 3-year-old. Uh, when your kids are young, you're not exactly getting like these in-depth conversations about, wow, you know, mom, dad, uh, thanks for revealing the spousal love of Christ and for the church through your intimate embrace and your care for one another. <laughs> you're not going to get that kind of feedback. You might not get that until they're 30. Who knows? God willing. <laughs> so the point is here that we are planting seeds of the spousal mystery of love through our marriage. And by the physical expression of it, by the verbal expression of love and attentiveness to one another, Hopefully the kids, this kind of sinks into their psyche um, and it's down there so that when they reflect and go back and they think about their own life's choices and relationships, they can say like, yeah, yeah, I remember mom and dad present to each other, you know, not just sitting there with the blue glow of the iPhone on their faces at night, not talking to each other, but somehow they were like talking to each other and I saw what love looks like. Okay. The spousal, this is section four again, the spousal meaning of the body in its masculinity and femininity. Again, that means that you're meant to be a gift, I'm meant to be a gift, which manifested itself for the first time in the mystery of creation on the background of man's original innocence. John Paul says that we are in the world because God is, is a giver of gifts and we are a gift. It's united in the image of Ephesians with the redemptive meaning and in this way is confirmed and in some sense created anew. So, so married love, spousal love is always is a recreation. It's a, there's a, the, the mystery of the, the first love of man and woman is echoed in every contemporary historical present love. Let's look at section five. Uh, this is important with regard to marriage and the Christian vocation of husbands and wives. The text of Ephesians 5, 21 to 33, turns directly to them and speaks above all to them. Okay, he's being specific here. This is, this is great advice for married couples. Still, that linking of the spousal meaning of the body with its redemptive meaning is equally essential and valid for the hermeneutics of man in general. 
hermeneutics interpretation. In other words, the theology of the body and the spousal icon of love is essential interpretation of the meaning of life for every person, every single person, as I alluded to in the beginning of today's audience, right? Every man and woman um, can learn from this interpretation, the hermeneutics of this understanding of, of what we are here for and why we're here. For the fundamental problem of understanding him, for the self-understanding of man's being in the world. Okay, I understand myself through this mystery of spousal love. It's obvious we cannot exclude from this problem the question about the meaning of being a body, about the meaning of being as a body, man and woman. Okay, essential that we rediscover, rediscover it, through the light of creation and the new light of redemption, man and woman. Okay, I was reading this again this morning, you know, it was an article on um, transgenderism and parents losing all their rights. Uh, this was an Australian article um, that, that young men and women, young boys and girls, literally, at the age even of 11, 12, can be given without parental um, knowledge or permission uh, hormonal sex change drugs to, to alter them if they desire to become uh, the opposite sex, which is impossible. But this is a flight from, uh, from who we are, from the meaning of our being and the meaning of our being a body. There's so many deep wounds here, so many deep wounds. The theology of the body helps us return to our home, to return to the home of our body. And through the wounds and the aches that we have to discover what masculinity is and what femininity is. Okay, so therapeutic drugs, they're not therapeutic. Uh, these destructive intrusions into healthy reproductive systems and healthy sexualities are not going to help us. They're going to, going to estrange us from the meaning of our bodies and maleness and femaleness. Okay, so we have to come home to it. It was in, this con in that context itself that in some sense demanded that they should be raised. This classical text of Ephesians demands the same thing. And if the great mystery of Christ's union with the church obliges us to link the spousal meaning of the body with its redemptive meaning, in this link, the spouses find the answer to the question about the meaning of being a body. Okay. In the link of Christ's love for the church and the love of man and woman, we find an answer to the question about the meaning of being a body. And then we'll close with this bit. And there's, there's more in this audience. There's so much more. Is not the spousal love with which Christ loved the church, his bride, and gave himself for her equally the fullest incarnation of the ideal of continence for the kingdom of God, right? the hope of the next world? Is it not precisely in this, this love that support is found for all those men and women who choose the same ideal and thus desire this, to link the spousal dimension of love with the redemptive dimension? They desire to confirm with their lives that the spousal meaning of the body, of its masculinity and femininity, a meaning deeply inscribed in the essential structure of the human person, has been opened up in a new way by Christ. And with the example of his life, to the hope united with the redemption of the body. Okay, final thought, section 7 at the bottom. Marriage is organically inscribed in this new sacrament of redemption just as it was inscribed in the original sacrament of creation. There's so much here. Uh, I think I'll do one final quote, but <laughs> if you've been listening along and following these audiences as we unpack them, I'm briefly moving through some of the thoughtful insights from John Paul. You know, this theme of over and over and over again of marriage, spir spiraling and spiraling, and we have to practically let it affect us and affect us, touch our emotional life. This walk of faith, this life of faith, is so far from obligation. I've said this before. John Paul is showing us it's not about obligations, but about relations. That the love of God is real, tangible, incarnational. He wants it to be so clear to us that he gives us this sign of marriage over and over again. I know there's this war on marriage today. We hear that expression, right? This war on marriage. This constant isolation pushing people away from each other, pulling us apart, this velvet anarchy, right? Kind of a, this soft, like, just tolerate everything as long as you don't affect me or touch me. But we're, it's really hellish that we just further and further remove ourselves from others, from, from what marriage is actually saying. What is marriage? 
Marriage is this enmeshing beautifully with another person. Consecrated, celibate, single. The human person is made for this beautiful relationship, not for isolation. And God wants this. And this is God. And this is the life of God. And this is what heaven is going to be. It's, it's going to be the intimacy of marriage as we understand it on earth to the billionth degree. So we have to prepare now by pondering the sign of marriage. And final thought, section 8 of Audience 102. Man, who is from the beginning, male and female, must seek the meaning of his existence and the meaning of his humanity by reaching all the way to the mystery of creation through the reality of redemption. Okay, this is our quest. There he finds also the essential answer to the question about the meaning of the human body, about the meaning of the masculinity and femininity of the human person. The union of Christ with the church allows us to understand in what way the spousal meaning of the body is completed. Okay, press into that. Here's our church today, um, the Catholic Church in the throes of scandal and hierarchical confusion and abuse and oh, there's all sorts of stuff we can go on and on about what the bride of Christ is suffering here on earth today institutionally structurally right and because of our own fallen humanness and weakness but all the while Christ loves his bride the church Christ died on the cross for his bride the church okay this living organic beautiful thing this mystical body of Christ and every single marriage we see around us also in the throes of sin, human weakness, selfishness, right? Still the spark remains of eschatological hope that if we press into this sign, if we seek to remedy, redeem, um, bring God's grace into this sign of marriage, we can understand uh, what God is trying to say to us. So let's try to make this practical today. Try to be more attentive to the people around you, as I will try to as well, especially my wife and children. Be more focused in the present, be grounded in this moment, that when you encounter a human person today, another human person, you are encountering in some way the mystery, the call to gift, the call to communion. And uh, just allow ourselves today, Lord, please allow us to be awestruck and moved by the intimacy of human life, the intimacy of human friendship, the intimacy we're called to in human love. St. John Paul the Great, pray for us. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you next Wednesday.